I wanted to take a look at some scientific illustrations because technically that's what your next mini project is going to be about. So we are going to take some of those ideas that we started out with on the cross hatching and hatching and how to do an outline and apply it to a free form object. If we go back in time and kind of evaluate from the perspective of before photography, it makes total sense that scientists would need to have an artist to render these drawings, or maybe the scientist was the artist. So these are, drawings are important because they can also kind of document both wildlife and plant species from other places or a place that somebody or a scientist has not ever seen before. And that's what these artists, scientists were doing. They were kind of um, making their own illustrations or pictures to go along with the text and it would kind of go hand in hand. They could show a visual since visuals are so important to science, you, you really need those in order to explain a concept or to visually describe an object or a, a living thing. And that's what's cool about these scientific illustrations. Some of them are botanical studies, botanical meaning the study of plants or drawing of plants. Um, and by plants, it can mean the branch of a tree with fruit included. It could be the plant itself. Oftentimes there's, it's really detailed that includes like the bulb or the root so you can see the entire plant in its full. And like this lemon here is sectioned. You can see the section. You can also get a glimpse of the flowers. Or in this case, there's a section also of the um, mushroom. It's cut in half so you can see what it looks like from a profile or from the inside point of view. You can also see the underside of that mushroom that is kind of flopped over. Traditionally, these would be seen either in a textbook for students or they would be sold as a portfolio for the layman who was interested in studying the local plants, wildlife, or birds, kind of like a field guide. Here's how these drawings differ from a regular drawing. Because they are scientific illustrations, the artists had to pay very close attention to making sure that they were accurate with proportions, with coloring, with striping. They had to document and define the animal so that someone who had never seen it before could identify it. One name that I feel you should know is the name of John James Audubon. He really was a forerunner in scientific illustration and he did a lot of work by going out into the field and actually going into these natural habitats with a sketchbook and drawing these animals from life. And he was very passionate about birds. He was himself a scientist. He studied birds, but he also created a portfolio of wildlife too. And he's using a lot of the techniques that you've been employing. So hatching, cross hatch there in the fox. There's an incredible rich amount of complexity to that fox's fur and whiskers. There's even that gleam in his eye. Same thing, he's so sensitive about texture. Like in this one, you can really get a sense of the texture of the feathers too, and you get a very accurate description of the plant life and the environment the animal is occupying. Okay, so it's your turn now. I want you to go and find a reference picture that you think is really good. You kind of have a choice here because you could actually try and copy from an existing botanical study or if you want to be a little bit more original, um, I would recommend that you use a photograph of a plant or an animal if you wanted to do a scientific illustration. Find a really good photograph that has a good light source if you're doing a plant, I would try and find a, a picture that has the roots and if there's flowers, includes flowers and buds on there too because that's what a true scientific drawing does. It kind of documents it in various stages. So I'm doing a dandelion, so I found an image. I actually found a couple of images in case I wanted to use a second image as a reference too to add on to the drawing. So you might want to consider that as well. And this is relatively big. This is about the size of my hand. You saw me put my hand up there. And 
just so you know what I'm doing because it's kind of hard to see, I'm starting out with a series of little tick marks. Tick marks are these little marks and I use them for measuring. So what I'm doing there is I'm trying to get the proportion of the roots to the stems because I know that the stem is pretty long and the roots are shorter than the length of the stem. So it looks to me like about three quarters is plant and one quarter is root. So that's where I'm starting there. And just like with every single outline that you do, I want light, thin, and broken lines. That's gonna become your mantra. Light, thin, and broken lines. It's so important to do this. And, and some of you are doing this and adopting it beautifully. Others are still struggling with pressing too hard. And sometimes that's just because we're so used to gripping our pencil very tensely that you're making that mark. Or maybe it's that you're using a mechanical pencil and mechanical pencils are very easy to go too dark on. But try your hardest to press light. And you can see I'm starting off slow. So I'm actually going to time lapse this for you guys so you can see it because you've already seen me draw a lot. Um, here's one of the nice things, though, about doing a drawing of a plant. Plants are very forgiving. So I'd say um, you should always pick an image that you really love, that you like a lot, and you can commit to. But I'd also say if you are nervous about your skill level, if you feel like you're a beginning student, like a true beginner, that you haven't done a lot of art, try doing a plant because they are much more forgiving than an animal. But if you want the challenge of an animal, by all means, I applaud you. So it is easier to draw the plant when there's a simple background. You can probably see my picture, my reference that I'm using off to the left, and there's a very simple background. That's helpful to me because I can then look at the negative space in between the leaves and in between the flowers and stems. So remember, negative space is the open area, the empty area in between the actual positive space. And positive space would, of course, be like the leaves are positive because they're taking up space. The flower, the stem, the little bud, those are all positive. So I actually look at the empty space and see that as a shape in addition to looking at the positive shape too. And because I'm drawing so light, it's very easy for me to erase my mistakes. I do look and I, I always ask myself, what kind of line is it? Is it a curvy line, straight line? What's the angle on it? What's the pitch? And when I'm thinking about angles, I oftentimes think of a clock, the way a clock face works. And I'm like, okay, is that one o'clock? Is that at like 10 o'clock? What, what is, where is the hand of the clock pointing? And it kind of helps me to get it right. And I am deliberately putting my drawing at an angle. So it's slightly angled, the, the dandelion itself, on the page. And that is actually helpful to the composition. If you have a straight vertical composition that's perfectly in balance, it can be boring. Like if you were to do a tulip bulb and have the tulip be dead center of a vertical paper and not have anything that's slightly asymmetrical, then it can be like a boring image because there's not enough going on to break up the space. I tend to gravitate towards asymmetry. So when we're talking about balance in art, asymmetry means it's not equal on both sides. So if I were to take a pair of scissors and cut this drawing right down the center line, it wouldn't be equal. It wouldn't be an exact mirror image. And I am trying to get this to be accurate. I'm looking if there's like a bend in the leaf. I'm looking if one crosses over into another. The dandelion has that really kind of cool sawtooth edge to the leaf. So I am looking at how that interacts with the rest of the plant. And if I make a mistake, um, that's okay. I can adjust it at this stage. So just like with the dessert drawing, I'm going to ask you to work on this and get a solid outline and then turn it in for feedback. So I'm going to super fast forward this 
for you. That way you don't have to watch me draw everything in real time, which took quite a bit. Looks like it took me about 50 minutes to do this sketch, which is why I think I'm going to give you a little bit more time when you're working on it, so that way you can do a really good, thorough job. Okay, so I'm wrapping up the finishing touches on that dandelion flower, getting in the multi layers of petals in there. And just like some of you guys, I start to be a perfectionist and then I see all my mistakes. But here's my finished piece. It's at this stage that I want you to submit it as an outline in Google Classroom and turn it in as a slide alongside your reference picture. <laughs> 